Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are. Good afternoon to Ivan Jikic, and thank you very much for joining us today. Ivan Jikic is professor in molecular signaling at the Institute of Biochemistry at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. So thank you very much for being here and for joining me and for this for being uh, present at this uh, short uh, live interview, which will be recorded and available later on. I just wanted to start with a very short uh, icebreaker and ask you. What got you excited by microbiology as a child and why? Yeah, I think I, I grew up next to a father who was a veterinarian. And as you can imagine, microbes are all around there. So there was a lot of curiosity. And from curiosity, you become a scientist. And as a scientist, you cannot avoid microbes. They're all around us. They are very rich source of information. We can learn a lot from them. And I believe part of my success is owned also to this curiosity in the world of microbes. And I think especially now it resonates really much to the microbes around us with the current pandemic. But I think one also tend to forget that most bacteria, most microorganisms are, are beneficial, the vast majority of it. And that is, is, is a pity sometimes that this doesn't cause, com, comes over, I would say. But um, it's on one side, one can understand that. We are, as humans, we are much more concerned about the danger than about commodities around us, or at least we don't understand how many commodities we have also our micro or microbiota. These are our beneficial commodities. And we have ignored them for many, many years. It's good that they became now a center of research by understanding how much communication comes out from such a vast number of bacterial cells within our body. And then instead of focusing only on pathogenic bugs, pathogenic uh, viruses or, or parasites, obviously, you know, the disease is um, as well very important. And in a way, we need to know more about those because they're attacking us. They're causing uh, acute or chronic consequences to, to us as humans. And that's why we have a medicine. That's why we are successful and, and survive through the evolution. Can you tell us a little bit about your current area of research and how can it help answer what is happening uh, around us in the world right now? Maybe not necessarily about COVID, even though it is a very prevalent news, but also in mm. other areas, if this is the case. I finished medical school and, and became a physician by basic education. And after that one, I moved to New York where I started to do structural biology and biophysics, chemistry. So today my lab is a truly interdisciplinary. We use any possible modern technologies, particularly the cutting edge, the very new ones, which will actually help us to be seeing the details in a, in a, in a way that we could never do it in the past. But the questions that we ask are undefined. We are um, a lot of time driven by an importance or by serendipity, sometimes by a, a curiosity, which is driven by the bar discussion. And once you define that, you get on the focus the project and use all the possibilities that you have. And this would makes my lab very successful. First of all, people collaborate within the lab. They form the teams. They use anything possible. And then we collaborate if we don't have that in Frankfurt or around us. We collaborate with people very early on, share our information and knowledge. And, and in that case, in the last decade, from cancer, neurodegeneration, we became very much interested in bacteria and in bacteria, particularly Salmonella, Shigella, and most recently, Legionella pneumophilia, which is still a, a serious concern with all these jacuzzis, bad air conditioning. Even today, when Legionella spreads through the hospital in New York, like a few years back, you have no antibiotics, you have no drugs that will help, and more than a dozen people died in that accident. So we are trying to understand these bugs, we are trying to understand their uniqueness. And then also try to understand the common way how our body responds to them. And in that case, we would like to understand the prototype behavior toward the pathogens in general. And then there was a, just a consequence beginning of this year that um, our labs were shut down because of the COVID uh, crisis. And then we used the same enzyme we were studying in bacteria and tried to search for them in a COVID, found some of the families of proteases, and truly we... We discovered something quite important and we discovered how this specific papain like protease from COVID or COV2 enzyme is could be blocked and what this is as a consequence to virus and consequence to interferon antiviral response. 
manuscript was finished within five months in collaboration with six groups around Europe. And we transported reagents by cars and so on because it was shut down complete. But the success is common. Success was quite nice. And we are now following up, trying to figure out whether we can really create an alternative to vaccination, alternative drugs that will specifically block this enzyme and thus uh, block viral spread and eventually increase the antiviral response in a host. One question would be, what has this current pandemic taught us about how we deal with public health? First of all, um, this pandemic crisis taught us that we were totally unprepared globally. When you look at the global response, it was a total failure. On the other side, it taught us also that science has an amazing, amazing power. Scientists around the world within less than 10 months have accumulated more valuable information than in any other single topic in the history of, of human race in terms of knowledge, in terms of technologies, in terms of new capacities for detecting, testing, as well as now 11 vaccines uh, within the clinical trial uh, um, phase three, all within 10 months and or 11. And if you if you consider that, this is this gives um, a power message to the society saying, trust science, trust scientists, trust the data. And then if you do that, a consequence will be the beneficial for young, for generations, old ones, but also the, the society in general, the economy, the, the justice, the social equality, as well as those who are in danger in our countries. All of this can be helped if we are well prepared and we follow the data and follow them very carefully with full responsibility. So I think the, the pandemic, even though it is terrible, it has really uh, changed the world from one to another day. It blocked us. Seven billion people were in one or another way of quarantine. But yet we can learn and we should learn from this and be better for future, be better prepared and just move to the positive side and look how much we have accomplished already. Another question for you, also related to T's in a way. So besides being the leading expert in the field of ubiquity in biology and cancer research, you are committed to the education of next generations of scientists and have been honored by uh, for your effort to popularize science. So I jump a little bit in my list of questions I prepare to ask you, what are, the, um, in, in your opinion, the biggest challenges in communicative science? Um, so what do, why do you think that despite increasing efforts by individual res researchers in science communication, these are not considered for a career progression in science? Look, today the, the communication is a general problem. Social media have taken the center stage of a flow of information within the subgroups. And these subgroups are defining which information they want to accept. I mean, when you have a, the groups of the, of the, on the social media, they define their rules. So now if somebody comes from outside and say, hey, look at this data, look what science says, look at the danger. If we are not being able to transfer this message to this group, they will be completely wasted. They will ignore it. And this is very often happening now with many topics, not only scientific topics, but also relevant topics of um, you know, uh, dangers which are ahead of us, uh, the current politics the the businesses and then the facts are very difficult to be uh, proven because if they define for them what they believe in i mean that's that's the fact so i think what we need to do as a, as a world and i think there was there is a lot now going on you really need to change the responsibility of social media in what and how they transfer the information and particularly under the conditions of pandemic threats where all these fake news where a lot of lies were placed around, a lot of completely unjustified statements. And nobody has ever been able to deny them because there are so many and they are spreading in the channels that you cannot deny. So the only stuff that is left to us is to keep straight, to keep straight our work, our scientific knowledge, and uh, try to educate the new generations, our kids, students, uh, pupils in schools, that they think carefully what is the fact, whom do they trust, who are authorities, whom they would like to rely upon. And that if we manage that, we will have the majority of, of our societies on the right track. And then minority will, with the time, change their course. I always believe and I'm very optimistic on that. So it seems, it seems to me that you're saying that um, 
the way the news are, are are spreading today it's different than before and that's that's it's something that uh, it's 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 not necessary for science or scientists to address because it's it's outside your mm-hmm. remit but then at the same time do you think there is a way that scientists can help or can engage with with people then maybe mm-hmm. uh, just discard truth or how can scientists help yeah, I think we just need to be active in, in the public. I think there is no way we can sit in our offices, keep, keep publishing our papers and educate our students. Part of our duty as academics is also to go to public, to popularize science, to talk about our work, to engage in a discussion. For example, now with the COVID crisis, beautiful examples in every single country you're going to see a genuinely talented scientist who can communicate with the public, who have who have done tremendous work in their own countries to promote truth, facts, right measures. And those countries that have followed this scientific appeal and scientists were active, those countries had much better response, much better measures, and there were less people infected and less people died, unfortunately, in in some cases. But there where scientists can do a lot. So the message is, let's be active, let's communicate our knowledge to the public, and that will be a part of our contribution. And maybe this question is a bit difficult to answer, but why do you think that communicating science is not considered often as, as an achievement for career progression? I mean, I don't think that it's not considered now. It's getting more and more uh, considered by the public. I mean, I'm seeing here in Germany, my very close colleague here in Frankfurt, Sandra Zizek. She just joined the Frankfurt a year ago and um, just started with virology department. She came directly in the middle of pandemic. She she has managed so well. There was a lot of help from the colleagues in Frankfurt, a lot of communication, but she grew up so fast as the one of the publicly recognized expert in COVID. And she's having a podcast together with Christian Rosten from Berlin. And in that case, you suddenly see this feedback to her recognition in which she motivates herself to to engage in that one, otherwise she would lose uh, her work time, but she feels how important it is. And I do feel for myself as well in the career, anytime I engaged in a, in a public um, uh, debates, in a public educational projects, that young people have been the major source of uh, feedback to me and the major energy to continue and do it again in the future. Great, great. Another question related to science communication and, in, and, and, and more about reaching decision makers. Do you think that approaches that scientists use to communicate their research to a broader audience um, can also be used to reach policymakers or is different approaches? Yes, that's right. This is, this is absolutely connected. It's like a one tube with the water. If you work on a public, you're going to work on a politician as well. The same way around. If you transfer some of the good messages to a political uh, arena where the decisions are made, and this is very good. Obviously, this is going to be reflected to the society as well. One example is ERC, establishment of ERC came from scientists, but came via politics. And eventually, this has made amazing impact on societies, on different countries, on the public across the European Union. I think that's one of the best examples where science, politics, and societies have been incredibly well integrated. COVID crisis is the second one. We still have a lot to do. We have amazing uh, challenges, difficult ones in, ahead of us. The pub, uh, the, you know, public understanding of the global warming, of what is expecting in um, in pollution of nature. How do we communicate between each other, between different countries? What is solidarity? How do we make the you know how do we make the balancing life on education, on payment for health system? All of these things are ahead of us, and just by engaging together public experts from different disciplines and politics or politicians, this triangle needs to work together. How do we come together? It's not always easy. The webinars, Zoom lines are now quite convenient. People can connect, we can share information more. But I think it's very critical to be within the alternative media, meaning uh, social media, as well as a classical media, TV, newspapers, and so on, because we need to cover, we need to cover the entire spectrum of our uh, public. 
So it's about uh, being present, being connected, and bringing the message out there and uh, communicate to different stakeholders and to different group of people. But very often right. science is also very complex. So it's sometimes it's difficult to communicate or you need to simplify quite a bit. And and then for, for researchers, it might be a bit uh, trivial the way uh, they express the science. So what do you think is a good approach? Science needs to be simplified to... Uh, to be communicated effectively mm. or other approaches maybe need to no i mean science science needs to be presented to be understandable understandable means you need to have a different levels of details you want to present if i go to the primary school kids of the age of 10 i am not giving the same lecture if i am lecturing my students at medical school that's very obvious if you go to public you cannot pretend that ubiquity is known to everyone so it is natural, the people who want to engage, they need to have a first mission. And this is the message that he, he or she wants to transfer to the uh, audience needs to be understandable, needs to be factual, and needs to be neutral. We should not take sides, particularly in the debates about the drugs, about influences and so on. So these are the three messages. And of course, we are different. People are different. Scientists, some scientists don't have a talent for this. Other scientists have amazing talent, like with the music, like with the sport. Not everyone is a great sportsman. So those who have a talent, they should use it. They should go to public. They should talk. And those who don't do it, they should not despise these people by saying, oh, they simplify it too much, or they are making it so, so for public. Yes, that's why we need to do it. We need to make it understandable for public, but factual, as I said. So I think we, um, we, we can say in Germany or in Europe, we can say that a lot of young people get engaged at the early stage. They are learning how to present. It's not always easy. Sometimes you feel, oh, I didn't really do well. I didn't describe them this mechanism, that mechanism. But at the end of the day, when you get the feedback from people and they tell you, wow, this is so nice, so many details, I eventually understood how this and this drug works, why the cancers are so complicated to treat where the resistance to cancer happens. These are very complex questions. And if you manage to excite the people with the understanding and the knowledge, that what comes back to you as a popularizer and you say, wow, I did very good work. Great. Let's go back to the, to the lab. And uh, then I have a question for you, given your interest and your commitment to, uh, to engage with the next generation of scientists. What is your your approach to support early career scientists? I think you just need to have a good communication, daily contact, and think about uh, think about their needs, what they will do after your lab. One of the first questions I ask people who join my lab, what is your vision after you finish your postdoc or finish your PhD? If they know, it's very easy task for me because I remember, and I work with those people three, four, five years, we come to the same vision because my interest is also that these people accomplish what they want in the future. And therefore, when you have a common interest, it is it is easier. Obviously, there are many ups and downs. There are many things that do not work. There are many difficult moments. As a mentor, you need to be always uh, here to hear the problems. Not always you can solve all of them. But um, I think it's important to understand that even when we fail, there is uh, something we did together and there is something that is good in all of this. And the worst what you can do as a mentor to anyone is to only criticize. And that's what I learned very early on because a success is a consequence of communication, motivation, good results, and another motivation because it's a cycle. It's a cycle that eventually leads you to success. And for me, success of a young person who works with me is that she or he accomplishes what they wanted. They publish, they uh, get awards, but most important is would, what do they want to do in the future? Do they want to become academic professor? Do they want to be a group leader somewhere? Or they just want to go to a new challenges, a new technology environments, a new institutes. And I have to say I was uh, lucky up to now, most of the people who work in the lab, in our institute, have found their own way. And that makes us quite quite happy and, and satisfied. Great. 
what advice will you have to a young scientist going to a first conference? Of course, now it's online, so it might be a bit different, but what advice will you give to someone attending the first conference for the first time? I will just tell them, don't, don't sleep much, get engaged in discussions, communicate with anyone you can do, ask a lot of questions and be very curious. Don't, don't think that in the next hall, in the next conference group, it's a very boring. Sometimes you don't know what is waiting in the lecture and therefore be very alert. From my own experience, when I started to go for the first meetings and these were the, the like Frederick meetings and the cancer in America, as well as the Keystone meetings, those meetings have actually installed within me a necessity, a need to go for at least one, two, three. Now I go to more than 30, 40 conferences in a year. And this kind of an interest and a, a talent that you want to communicate also your data and don't be afraid to talk about your own data, uh, about asking the questions, what really bothers you. Of course, you should not release everything that your mentor does not want you, but there are ways of asking such that you get uh, a lot of answers back. So I think the, the issue here, we are gonna be on, on Zoom, we are gonna be on webinars or whatever online, you just understand that this is also a new way um, you are maybe more flexible and easier than many of the uh, presenters in using these technologies so just make fun just send some of the chats and some of the nice questions signs or, or, or any of them any of the of your own uh, messages and in that way be present and um, learn as much as you can because this is why the conferences are made they're made for you and for sharing and so learning. it's about communicating and connecting with people and uh, even till now we are online so it is different there is still many chances to connect and maybe even more uh, chances to connect in some way because maybe for some people it's easier to to try to to attend an online conference and traveling because of travel restrictions or budget reasons or whatever. Correct. And if you think about online um, conferences, which is for many people uh, s something absolutely new or for all of us in a way, uh, then what do you think are the pros and cons of uh, online conferences versus um, classical in-person conferences? Pros are that we don't need to travel. We don't lose a lot of uh, um, time of traveling. Second of all, we also decrease the um, CO2 imprint and many of the things will be beneficial by not, not traveling so much. The, um, the second pro is that you can, you can actually be in, at more places, more activities in a much shorter time. The contrasts are that you lose this personal contact because once you are with someone talking, it's... Um, there is a body language, there is a, a smiling, there is a much more warm uh, communication. There are bars that you go in the evening or, or restaurants for dinners in which a lot of new ideas happen, but just spontaneously. And this will never, never be lost. I'm sure when COVID crisis is over, we will all go back to the regular conferences and the future will be combination between the online versus Com uh, classical conferences because both of them will have benefits and both of them will be needed by by scientific community so we will sometimes be able to connect around the world within an hour and sometimes we will travel all the way to japan to spend one week there meet each other have a, a lot of lot of fun and then get collaborations done there locally and then come back to our cities and work and then connect to our Zoom again or so via again, online. Uh, seeing the positive into negative. So new opportunities arising and and uh, hopefully, probably, hopefully it is, will also be stay, the positive sides will stay with us in the future as well. And one le less, last mm -hmm. question that I have, it's again about international nature of science and, and scientists. So uh, scientists are, are truly globetrotters. They travel to conferences a lot when they can, of course, but they also relocate very often return career for a PhD or for postdoc until they get a more permanent position. So how important do you think is the international natur nature of science to its effect effectiveness and success? The answer to that one is diversity. In science, we need diversities in uh, age, gender, culture, nationality, disciplines. All of this helps it. A good part of uh, science of 21st century is that 
in most countries, you already have a very large degrees of movements and people are in our lab from eight different countries. That makes it such that you don't really need anymore to maximize your chance to go to Canada or to go to Australia for a postdoc because you may meet these people here in Germany. So in that aspect, it is not as essential as before because before we were learning a lot about uh, other people, different ways of organizing science. Now you have it all integrated within the institutions in the different cities. So that's good. But to live in another country for two, five years, it's amazing enrichment. I was leaving Croatia when I finished medical school to New York, spent there five years, and then dedicated six years of living in Uppsala in Sweden with starting my family, getting kids there. The nicest moments which I had, even though they were very different from all what I had before, and I learned tremendously there. And then after Sweden, we moved to Germany. So we are now in Germany for long and we like it here. And then we went to California again during sabbatical and stayed there for two or three years. And, you know, this gives you this kind of movement. And I myself, I need the change. So I was always searching for the different cultural ambience or, or intellectual uh, challenges where I would be challenged and I would be led toward a new kind of new surprising discoveries. So I would give your students an advice, even if you have everything around yourself, look a little bit further, look on horizon and look where deep in yourself you are searching for something. So before we were going for sabbatical to California, I went home to kids and I said, maybe we should go to China. Let's go to Shanghai for two or three years. You're going to learn the new language. This might be a long future for you, but it might be very valuable. Maybe not, yeah. And eventually with all the discussions, yeah, with all the discussions, okay. we voted for California. <laughs> well, thank you very much for sharing your uh, personal experience with us and uh, your, your insight with us. Professor Jikic is going to no, be uh, presenting on Saturday at the Calvin Roundtable. Um, which happens between 1.30 and 4 p.m. Central European time. And uh, thank you again very much for joining. And I wish you a, a nice, a pleasant, a successful online conference. Thank you very much for your time. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye -bye. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.